This is Pink Talks, the place where we discuss intersectionality and human rights. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of our sex education uh, talks, uh, a series in which we are exploring questions on how sex education can be inclusive of high quality and serve its purpose in informing people on how to make good choices about their sexual activities, relationships, and their sexual health. Um, also, we are discussing what may be going wrong with sex, sex education that most people are receiving today, if they receive anything at all. Um, in today's talk, we'll be discussing sex, sex education in schools. And my name is Femke, and I'm your co-host today, today, together with my colleague, Leah. <laughs> Hi, um, it's great that you could join. So today we're joined by um, our guest speakers. First, we have Jenny Sperling. Um, Jenny Sperling is an assistant professor of critical studies and education in the Department of Educational Leadership um, and Policy Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Oklahoma, she completed her PhD in education at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And Jenny's research interests include peer um, sexual health education, K through 12 um, educational policy and local legisl legislation, and creating care-centered community collaborations in and outside of um, outside of that prioritize, prioritizing youth and their needs. So, Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, is there anything else you would like to add about yourself, maybe, or your research? No, I'm just super excited. I think we covered, we'll get into it a little bit. Um, but yeah, happy to be here. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, and we're also joined by um, Dr. Eva Goldfarb. And Dr. Eva Goldfarb is professor at public health at Montclair State University in New Jersey. Over the past 30 years, she has developed and led sexuality education and sexual health programs for youth, parents, educators, and other professionals that has, um, that has trained current and future school teachers across the United States. Dr. Goldfarb is co-author of several sexuality education curricula, including rights, respect, responsibility, being out, staying safe, a sexual, a sexual health curriculum for LGBTQ plus youth, and our whole lives, uh, grades four to six and grades 10 to 12. She has published widely in the area of human sexuality and sex education, how to develop the national sex education standards and the national teacher preparation standards for sexuality education in the United States. She uh, mostly, most recently, her study with co-author Dr. Lisa Lieberman, 30 years of research, the case for comprehensive sex education, published in Journal of Adolescence Health, provides evidence for the effectiveness of inclusive, sex-positive, social justice-focused sex education beginning in kindergarten. For her work, Dr. Goldfarb was awarded a doctorate, uh, an honorary doctor of human Lit letters, the Golden Prick Award by the Center of Sex Education and the Professing Excellence Award for Outstanding Education Practice by uh, Montclair State University. So nice to also have you here with us today, uh, Eva. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I'm so excited to be here and to talk about this really important topic. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Great to have both of you here. Um, yeah, so um, why don't both of you tell us a little bit, start off by telling us a bit about why did you first become interested in the topic of sexual education personally, but also within your career? Any of you can start, <laughs> both of you. Okay, I'll go first. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, 
was getting my, I, I didn't get to this field the way a lot of other people did. I was getting my master's degree in communications and as a graduate research assistant was involved in a study on pornography and on its um, images of women and its treatment of women. I watched more pornography than I ever wished to in my entire life um, in doing that. But it also um, just lit a fire under me about certain th issues related to sexuality. And then I took a graduate course in human sexuality. And within the first two hours of the class, I realized this is where I want to be. It, it was like an epiphany. I know that sounds kind of trite, but that's exactly what it was for me. It brought together all of the pieces of my life that were so important, not only my scholarly interests and my professional interests, but in myself as a daughter, as a sister, as a sexual partner, um, and all of the issues I cared about sort of intersected right there. Um, and that's when I decided this made the most sense to be able to do what I wanted to do. Um, so I pursued a PhD in uh, human sexuality education, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And it's the most fulfilling, rewarding um, career I could have hoped for. Yeah. Um, mine's maybe a little, I, guess, I feel like mine doesn't follow the a very standard uh, journey either. I wasn't like, I want to do sex ed, like from a younger age. When um, personally for me, um, when I was an adolescent, I had so many questions. I had questions and I had things going on in my life about my own sexuality. Um, I was, you know, dating, I was dating girls, but not telling my family, really like messing with my own queer sexuality at a young age, not even knowing what that meant. Um, and how to navigate it. Um, so I had my own sort of questions for myself, and that's where I sort of got into it, if you will, personally. But when it comes to the professional, I guess, journey, I was in graduate school, but at the time, really just interested in critical studies and education, um, but didn't really know. I was interested in gender and race and language, um, but I was teaching a feminist studies class um, as, as a teaching assistant called Sex, Love, and Romance. And um, Dr. M Dr. Mireille Miller-Young is brilliant. And I was working with her and she had a lecture one day and asked this room filled with like 450 undergraduate students, like how many of you have received sex education that's actually been helpful for you? And no one, like no one raised their hands and that that one moment was just like a spark for me where I was like, all of us were in agreement, even like the graduate instructors, same with other folks in this space. And I was like, huh, I'm not alone in this, you know, especially as a queer younger person, uh, I'm definitely not alone in this. So that was sort of where I was like, you know what, maybe I'll sort of shift and maybe I'll, I'll stick with sex, love and romance and also think about sex education in schools. So that was like my professional little, little moment as a teaching assistant in class. Um, and now that's where I am um, just starting. <laughs> I'm a first year. Uh, actually, I just finished my first year. I just finished my first year as an assistant professor. Um, and so my career is just getting, just getting started. Nice. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to, like um, having very mediocre sex education or not having any at all. That's what right. I talk about it a lot, actually. Yeah. And it's almost like um, we, we all nod our heads, right? And we're like, And even when we're strangers, we're still nodding our heads and we're like, let's fix this, let's fix this. And it's constant. And then that's why just like, you know, that's why we're all here talking about it because it's so important still. Um, could each of you maybe tell us a little bit about what you're currently working on or um, maybe some of your like most recent research that you've been doing? I feel like you should start with this one because it sort of was alluded to maybe in the introduction. So go for it. Okay. So I, from the minute I got into this field, um, I recognized that the way most people talked about sex education was as a way to prevent pregnancy, unintended pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections. And from day one, that was never 
the part that I was the most interested in or thought was the most important. I always felt that really good comprehensive sex education could do so much more. But the research is all related to pregnancy and disease prevention because that's what's fundable, that's what's measurable, and that seems to be what's what seems to be least controversial. And so um, I've been frustrated over the years that that's really where all the emphasis has been. So my work has always been on um, teaching young people, training educators and um, future educators and parents about how to broaden that out and to make it sex education its full rate the full cover the full range of um of topics and issues and skills that we want it to do um and there is this nagging piece throughout my entire career though that um was like but all the major research is really on pregnancy and um sti and uh, prevention and the big arguments were about whether abstinence education, at least in the United States, whether abstinence only until marriage education um, was more effective. Let's just tell kids not to have sex and that's easy and we'll tie it up with a ni nice ribbon and, and put it away. Or whether what has been called comprehensive sex education is more effective. But what most people mean when they say comprehensive sex education is we teach about abstinence and also contraception and sin for sex. Um, but the goal is still always behavior change. The goal is always still to prevent pregnancy and STIs. So um, my colleague and I finally um, took on this massive project um, and it took us three years, but we wanted to see what comprehensive high quality sex education can do beyond the pregnancy disease, because there's so much in the literature that already shows us what good comprehensive sex ed can do. And so we did what's called a systematic literature review um, of the last 30 years of research. We started with 1990 and we picked that um, as a date because 1990 um, is, a, is, a, was a, is a benchmark for, a, I would say, for the modern era of sex education. That's when the CECUS, um, guidelines to comprehensive sex education came out um, and that started to sort of push back against the abstinence only and the contraception piece. So we looked at the last 30 years of research and we ended up after looking through some 55,000 articles, we got down to about 8,000 articles that were specific to sex education. And then we purposely eliminated those that were only interested in um, disease and, and sexually transmitted infections. And what we found was really exciting. We found that um, comprehensive sex education that's scaffolded across grades, embedded in supportive school environments and across subject areas can improve sexual, social and emotional health and academic outcomes for young people. So it um, increases prevention of child abuse. It increases prevention of dating and interpersonal violence. Um, it decreases homophobic and uh, transphobic bullying and harassment. It promotes healthy relationship. It builds life skills um, and it increases media literacy. So all of these things are, are things that those of us who have been in the field sort of already knew in our guts or strongly suspected, but up until now we didn't have the evidence for it. So that's been really exciting. Um, and we've gotten a lot of um, attention for it, which is a little bit, it's exciting um, at this point in my career um, to be able to contribute something like that, that's sort of been gnawing at me for 30 years and was finally able to um, contribute uh, from science in a way that I think will help with the field. So that's what I've been up to. <laughs> that's awesome. Um... Yeah, I like I mentioned before, I just moved to Oklahoma um, and I'm coming from a very specific California context and now entering into a very specific um, <laughs> Oklahoma context, a little bit different when it comes to legislation and thinking about school based sex ed. Um, so with California as a very famous California Healthy Youth Act, right, we're thinking about what comprehensive sex education means 
in legislation, yes, but then in practice, what that looks like. So that's my, my previous work was really interested in like, okay, we have this legislation, it sounds pretty good, uh -huh, but what does it actually look like when we get into a classroom, right? Um, do we meet those marks? Not just our, every, um, yeah, I'm not gonna say in compliance, but beyond this idea of compliance or really thinking about what's happening from policy to practice idea. Um, but now in Oklahoma, um, I'm, I'm a community-based person. Like a lot of my work is community-based and youth-based. So for right now, it's just trying to figure out a new space for myself. And what, like I said, what really is happening with, when it comes to sex education in Oklahoma. Um, so I'm, I'm really engulfed in that right now, starting to build and create relationships with, yes, K through 12 schools, but also higher ed. Um, I know a lot of the sex ed that uh, research is specific to K-12, but it really has an influence on higher education as well. Um, and being in the community there for now the year, um, I've actually started to focus a little bit specifically on young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, special education in Oklahoma um, needs a lot of help. I, mean, I think it's across the country, um, but also just at the university where I am, there's been an increased awareness and concern for sex ed. Um, and being more of a K through 12 person, um, in the past I thought this, but that's actually where my research right now and ideas are going working with, with young adults who are at OU um, and thinking about sex ed and new curriculum and just based on what they need, right? There's great curriculum that exists um, and tons of research, but really thinking about it from, okay, well, how do we meet your needs right now, right? Um, and I think that's also just something that I've always done is just going to the source first in my research. So that's sort of where, where I'm at right now. And Jenny, I would also add that's so important because we we have these college educate, you know, these college students, these young adults, and we say, what are their needs? But a lot of them have come through without any sex education at all. And so I'm always struck by the extent to which a lot of I, I and I'd love to know if this is true with you, but a lot of what they need is often what they should have been getting when they were 14, 15 years old. Um, and we're now helping to teach this to them when they're 18, 19, 20 years old. And um, I, I I don't know if you've had this, a similar experience. Oh, absolutely similar. Um, and yes, the answer, the, the short one, it is absolutely that that's, that's what's happening. Um, and especially when it comes to students with disabilities, um, they're purposefully sequestered from these conversations um, because there are stereotypes and these understandings of protection and at riskness and these sorts of things. Um, so, um, yeah, absolutely important. Yeah. And I think, uh, also, I think, um, as we already said, me and Leah, like we have, we have made the same experience. I think me personally, I think I, I don't remember any sex education at all, which probably means that it was either not there or really, really bad. So that it just slipped my mind like it didn't seem important so i think like also now like i'm in my late 20s and now i'm like getting into all these topics and i feel um like i missed out so on so much like when i was a teenager like so many things that i could have known maybe that would have prevented also maybe some negative experiences and yeah so i think uh, it's such a it's such a major major and important topic yeah <laughs> and to start young also <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so we have heard that both of you have already uh, long or medium, medium, medium long experience in research and <clears throat> um, talking about this uh, topic. And um, what would both of you say, like, what have you identified are major issues with such education in how it is taught today to students and pupils? Um, so from my perspective, um, it's still, I mean, I said this before, it's so focused on preventing bad outcomes and uses a definition of health that says absence of disease um, and absence of unintended pregnancy. And rather than a more expansive um, definition of sexual health that looks at things like agency and um, ability, decision-making ability and communication skills and ability to protect oneself and establish one's boundaries and enter into healthy relationships and enjoy their sex and sexuality. And uh, so I, you know, it's funny because, so we've all shared our sex education experiences. I'll tell you mine. 
this is my, the totality of my sex education experience was when I was in elementary school, I had a single class where they divided us up by boys and girls and the girls were all ushered into the gymnasium and I saw a film. The only thing I remember about the film is that it's okay to go swimming when you have a period, but make sure you wear a bathing cap. Um, it, it, but it didn't answer any of the questions that I or my peers had um, about what we were going through or about to go through. Um, and it left all of us feeling very um, uh, worried and afraid because we had these questions and the messages we were getting was, uh, don't ask those questions, those are inappropriate. And so we all sort of turned inside. And and I also, you know, my parents to their credit, and let's say my mom, really tried and and tried her best but she also didn't have any sex education and so she wasn't very good at educating me and so i learned mostly the way all of my peers learned which was from uh older siblings or from the school bus or from things that i heard or from rumors and uh that was really bad because i learned some really ineffective to say the least but also really poor information about um, about what sex and sexuality were all about. I learned nothing about my own body and about um, how I could make decisions about myself and and uh, communicate to get my, or even what my needs might be and how do I get those met. Um, and then in my last year of high school, there was the big family life course that we were all looking forward to and whispering about. And when we got into that class, they paired us up um, in heterosexual pairings, um, and every a girl with a boy, and we were supposed to be married, which meant we had to find a job, get an apartment, and figure out how we were going to pay our bills if we had children. And the lesson was, you know, don't get married until you have a job and are financially secure. And then we were launched out into the world. Um, and I was um, a lot the worse for that. And so I think when I came across the, the the program in sexuality education and it sort of raised all these issues for me. Um, it was based on that experience. And I think today we're still doing that. Um, certainly in the United States, I think a lot of um, countries in Europe are actually doing a much better job than the United States is, but um, there's still this I think adults are so afraid or anxious about talking about sex or sexuality. And so we like hold our noses, do what we have to do to check that box and make sure um, no one gets pregnant on our watch. And then we can move on and talk about the more important things. And so kids are both give, not given enough information and also given the message, don't ask for more information because you're not gonna get it from us. So um, it's unfortunate that that's still going on. That I, I would argue that's still the main way sex education is taught, if at all. Yeah, just to add on, um, so many things. I was thinking that um, you know it just doesn't actually start from a positive place in general, um, and I think it it should, right? I think it should start from a positive place, which is really speaking to this idea of prevention, right? Um, why are we always trying to solve an issue once a problem arises? Like what actually is the issue that we're trying to fix? Um, instead, we shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily approach it in this way. Um, we should start with something positive, like um, not necessarily centered on adults um, and what they think and how they think, let's say that youth um, should act or should be or should do with their bodies. Um, and there's so many, there's so much more than just the positive place. I'm thinking about how it needs to be inclusive, but not just like LGBTQ plus inclusion. I'm really thinking about like different learning styles, right? Um, and what that means for, for students. Is it only happening specific days of the week and why, right? Are conversations about sex ed always embedded in school, right? Um, I think about that happening in English curriculum, not just in health curriculum. Um, but I think, I think a lot of the issues are, are that we've been doing things a specific way for so long and the sex ed wars have been happening for so long um, that teachers still aren't supported. Many, many of them aren't supported and are teaching in places like I can say in Oklahoma where it's really risky to do the work. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, 
when we don't do the work, we're not saving lives. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a hard balance, I think. But I think some of the issues like, like I've just mentioned are those, but also we're still keeping secrets, I feel like. We need to be very transparent with youth, right? Really talk about the histories of why it actually is important that you know about your body, right? Um, and what's happened in the past to people's bodies and why sex ed is so important. Um, it, it's not just about teen pregnancy rates. Um, I'm really thinking about like forced sterilization in the United States. I'm thinking about like, I'm just thinking of so many things that youth and people should learn about in schools these historical traumas so they understand what how can they respect themselves and respect their friends and their loved ones um so yeah yeah i think um i grew up in like rural maryland and um and i i received sex education the same way young where we were split and it was more about like oh your menstrual cycle is going to happen and we learned that separately from the boys and then in high school, we had health class for half a year, and I was 17 at the time. So I remember having a conversation with my health teacher and saying, like, um, I'm 17, and I don't think it's appropriate to be teaching me only abstinence. This is like, I, I need more. And I remember her saying, you know, well, like, what would your parents think if you, if you, if they found out that you're asking these questions? And I was like, um, I think they would want my health teacher to teach me what I need to be taught. Because, I, I mean, I was really lucky. I had very open parents, and I, you know, I got a very good education from them. But I knew that other students didn't. And I, you know, I didn't get that kind of education until later in college when I, when I chose to take a human sexuality course. And I think that was the first time that I was like, oh, well, you know, we really lack these things until we're... I would think I was maybe 20 when I took that course and it was embedded in women's studies. It wasn't even like, you know, something out that people could really choose to take as like as a general course. Mm. So, yeah. I just, I really relate to that. And I, I find it really interesting that um, maybe not a lot has changed <laughs> and yeah, I, I really hope it does soon. <laughs> and, you know, Leah, when you said that, you had good education, but others around you didn't, that affects you too, right? Like when the people you're interacting with um, and getting into relationships with have had no education, that can have a negative impact on you and your ability to navigate your sexual self in the world. And when I think of sex education, for me, the way it currently is, the, the, the phrase that comes up for me is too little, too late. Um, we start it way too late. Um, like you said, you were 17. I think typically, um, other than the one puberty lesson, sex education typically starts in middle school or high school, which is the worst time to try to start having conversations about sex and sexuality, right? Um, just as we would never, no one would ever suggest teaching um, introducing algebra in eighth grade before first teaching foundational concepts of addition and subtraction and multiplication, for example, in the early elementary years. The same is true for sex education. We can't start to have these really intensive, complicated conversations when kids are 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 when they haven't had any practice or foundational concepts that can set the stage for that. So. I think it's a combination of too little, too late. Um, we tend to use a lot of scare tactics, even though the science shows that scare tactics do not work, um, particularly scare tactics to, to, to get young people not to have sex. Um, and this idea of like a one size fits all, that um, what young people in Oklahoma need are the same thing as what young people in California need, which is the same thing as what young people in New Jersey need or in the Netherlands or, um, in Germany, et cetera. And so there's a, um, a sort of global like decision from the top, top down that doesn't take into consideration what individual young people need and, um, and how to help them navigate. Yeah. So I know we've already used this term a few times, but um, it's comprehensive sex education, but could you both maybe give a definition of what you believe comprehensive sex is, or maybe also what it isn't, what it is not? Jenny, you want to take this first? I keep jumping in all the time. 
No, it's good. Um, yeah, I, without, you know, thinking about the literature and the research, right? For me, my immediate reaction is just like comprehensive is still not enough. Um, and what I mean by that is um, it, it's not, it's not rooted and framed like I go back to like historical contexts like it's not keeping like equity racial justice reproductive justice like at gender justice trans just like at the forefront um and I think that's really what inclusive or what comprehensive needs to do um I think there's a lot of words that we use in front of sex education right like we're talking about here we can say comprehensive we can say intersectional, we can say inclusive, and these are all really meaningful if they're meaningful to the communities that we're working with, right? So if it's meaningful to me as a white woman, it does not necessarily mean it's gonna be meaningful to a queer black boy. So I think it's really important to think about um, how we approach it. And when we say inclusive, I love that you're asking us, like, what does that actually mean to us? Because it might not mean the exact thing to the people who we're supposed to be teaching and preparing with this information. Um, but I, I think about other words that come to mind when I think of intimacy, or I'm sorry, um, I'm gonna say intimacy, um, inclusive or comprehensive. You know, I think about respect and self-awareness and, and, and intimacy and actually also the erotic. Like I think there are a lot of things that come into play here when we think about what comprehensive is without just adding a long list of commas, right? So in, we say anatomy, uh, reproductive organs, the ways that we shouldn't be talking about it in this way at all. Um, but you know, this longer list, I don't think a list is always good enough, right? You have curriculum that has 35 modules to be inclusive of almost everything that we can think about. But to me, that's just an additive approach to sex education, which we, which does a disservice to, again, the community who we're really hoping to serve. Um, so in the worst definition uh, that I just gave you, that's how I would sort of talk about <laughs> inclusive or comprehensive sex education. It needs liberation, I feel like, but. Um, I would just say ditto to everything Jenny just said. I don't think I could say it any better. Um, completely agree with everything. Um, and for me, I think also, we need to think more broadly around sex education besides just a class in a health education classroom. Um, and that one of the things that our research found is that some of the best sex education is done not in the health education classroom, but in English and social studies, in art and music, in mathematics. Um, and that those issues around um, social justice and equity and inclusion can be woven in throughout schools. And that those have some of the biggest impacts. Um, in fact, um, with the California Healthy Youth Act, that's one of the things that they're trying to do. There was a big study done in California that actually pointed out that exact thing, that when schools are inclusive um, and share those kinds of values throughout the curriculum, the, not only is there less harassment and less bullying, um, but not only do LGBTQ young people say they feel safer, but all kids feel safer um, and, and, and more attached to school. Um, I think for me, it also, so, so I think we need to think much more broadly about when we say comprehensive, because it has to do with just about every aspect of our lives. And so there's sex education that happens all the time throughout the day, every minute. Um, which is overwhelming, but also great that we could take advantage of moments. And I think it also involves promoting, and I don't like to use this term so much because I don't know that there's any such thing as universal per se, but what I like to sometimes call universal values that, um, you know, respect and dignity for all people, um, that children, all children are fine just the way they are and deserve to be loved. Um, and in a way that, in schools anyway, that every child can see themselves reflected in the curriculum and in the teaching. So um, everyone feels like it is um, addressing them. And, and that goes to Jenny's point about also the, you know, the intersections of, um, you know, very different diverse needs and identities that need to be um, addressed and considered. Um, I also think that to be truly comprehensive, we need to um, 
really question social norms and around gender and sexual orientation um, and help young people to start to question some of the messages that they're getting um, from culture about um, gender and sexual orientation at an early age before a lot of their assumptions and stereotypes um, get more ingrained and less mutable. So I think it has to, part of it has to be that we have to start very, very early in order to be truly comprehensive. Um, so Jenny, I know you did some research with um, ethnography. Um, I just was wondering too, like, um, how could the, sex, the, the sexual health educators and facilitators like ensure that it's, that the education is being focused on the students? And what did you find with that um, in the opinions of the students, but then also maybe some challenges that the um, educators or facilitators were met with? Yeah, um, I, I will say this over and over and, and over again. Um, youth need to be given like more opportunity to share their opinions, period, um, because they have them. <laughs> they have them and they have them about sexuality and gender and um, all things like we've said, that are sexual health education. Um, and I think it was a really exciting opportunity to be able to talk to them about it um, and and learn, you know, like, how are we doing with this sex ed? Uh, what do you think is missing? Um, and how could we do this better? And I think to provide a space to actually hear youth does not happen enough um, because there is an understanding in school systems, especially in the US, that like parents, parents should be the ones in charge of of the children, right? And what they're learning necessarily, or not necessarily learning, but uh, well, yeah, actually what they're learning and how they're learning it. Um, so with ethnography, uh, I was able to be there every day, like hanging out, getting to know these people um, and these students and same with the teachers and, and guest speakers. And um, some of the challenges are not having enough time to build relationships with you so we can have those conversations. And I think that also speaks to maybe it not only happening in one class, right? Also, maybe it's not only during school hours. I always think about like maybe sex ed, school isn't the place for sex ed. I know it's kind of a crazy, ridiculous thing to say in this conversation, but I do wonder about this because it's so it's so restrictive and it's so regimented, right? And structured that um, sometimes there's just not enough time to build the trust and relationships to then hear out students beyond an anonymous question box in sex education, which I think is really important, right? To also have anonymous things and anonymous questions. Um, but educators just want more time, you know, um, and more resources, uh, but time to spend with the resources, right? Because there's so many great resources out there, um, but they kind of come come at them all at once and there's not enough time to really sit with them and get, get into it, if you will. Um, but, um, learning from the students was that they, they had more things to say than just my interviews and conversations with them. And they want to be involved and they are involved locally beyond just the GSAs in their schools. Um, but it's also kind of scary, right? It could be a scary thing to, to have your opinions be heard as, as an adolescent, especially if it goes against your parents um, or your teachers. Um, so I, I think we just need to spend more time with youth like, I, I honestly think that, and I know that sounds like a really simple answer, um, but it, we, there's, that's how we build trust with them. Um, and that's how we learn from them because we can't do this work alone. Um, I definitely can. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Eva, um, you already talked a lot about uh, or a bit about your um, really exciting r research um, about the effectiveness of sex education beyond disease and uh, pregnancy prevention. And um, yeah, can you maybe share a little, share a little bit more um, with us about what you have learned maybe in terms of why it is so important to move um, towards really like comprehensive sex education in the in the way that you understand it um, and really dig into the subjects that you have already uh, both mentioned like um, gender equality sexuality um, consent relationships etc <clears throat> sure so um, 
when we start talking about sex education, and right now in the United States, there's a, I wouldn't say big controversy, there would people that would like us to think there's a big controversy about what's being taught, particularly in um, early grades. And there are bills that are being um, uh, proposed and passed and the infamous one in Florida that I'm sure you're aware of, the, the quote unquote, don't say gay bill, um, that are really misconstruing what sex education is all about um, and accusing those of us who want to um, or, or say that it's important to teach sex education in elementary schools, accusing us of being abusive or trying to recruit young people and in, into our own sexual agendas. Um, but the truth is that if what's really important is a couple things. One is that one of the, the findings that sex education, the best education didn't always happen in the health education classroom is great because what it says is that schools have the ability to find those teachers who have the best skills and dispositions and desire to talk about these topics with young people. And very often it's those teachers that um, young people trust and respect that are gonna be the best sex educators. And so this sort of opens that opportunity to say, um, you know, the health teacher may not be the one to be teaching about social justice and, um, and equality and equity, and that maybe you know, the social studies teacher should be doing it. So that's the first piece. But when we look at what happens in elementary school, it's things, I, I think there's there needs to be clarity about what actually is being taught there. It's pretty non-controversial um, if you look at what's actually being taught. So things like starting conversations about um, body integrity and boundaries. I get to decide who hugs me you get to decide who hugs you. And if I tell you I don't want to hug, then you don't get to hug me. Um, teaching boys in particular how to hear no and accept no. We don't do a good job, particularly in the United States, of helping boys to, um, to deal with being told no or rejection and not taking it personally. We raise boys and that's part of the whole gender norm of masculinity of you know, don't take no for an answer go out and get what you deserve go out and get what you think is coming to you and don't let any barriers stay in your way we raise boys and we support them and we applaud them when they do that we say that shows leadership and um, then when that translates into the sexual arena um, we now attack them as you know as rapists and so setting those kinds of ideas and expectations early conversations about um, what makes a good friend. A good friend is someone who likes you just the way you are, who always has your back, who supports you and lets you grow the way you want, who you can trust. That sets the stage for later conversations about what makes a good romantic and sexual partner. Um, everyone, uh, people come in different family structures and everyone is deserving of dignity and respect and love. Sets the stage for later conversations um, and later efforts at anti-bullying and harassment uh, um, efforts. So the, it can't be understated how important it is to sort of start early with developmentally age and culturally appropriate learning. And um, so I'd say that was one of the big important things that came out of that. And also, in general, sex education, when most of us think of sex education, we think of it in high school. And there's such, an, such a focus on adolescence as if um, before adolescence and after adolescence, no one needs sex education. No one's having sex, no one's in relationships. And so there's such this focus on adolescence. And Jenny, I loved how you put it about, we need to listen to adolescents. We need to hear what they say and what they ask and what they want. Um, and when they say they're in love, take it seriously and not to dismiss it as puppy love. No, these are real intense, um, heartfelt feelings. And how do we help young people who may not have a lot of experience with that to deal with that and and, and navigate through that? And 
Um, the other piece also that, you know, what, what Jenny talked about was, you know, ask young people what they want, because when you ask adults what they think um, young people need in sex ed, and then you ask young people what they want and need in sex ed, uh, it's like you're on two different planets. And so we need to be focusing a lot more on um, on, on young people's needs. So I would say, uh, and then the, the last piece that came out of the research, I think that was um, really particularly interesting was that using a social justice lens to teach is particularly effective with young people. Young children just naturally get the idea of fairness and equity and uh, you know, we share our toys and we play with everyone who wants to play and everyone should be treated well. Young people get the idea of fairness and that's a particularly good time to engage them in these kinds of conversations. Um, and using literature a lot um, seemed to be a really effective approach from early grades all the way through high school. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> um, I think that's a very important insight, right? That to realize that kids are actually open to have like these conversations about um, social justice in a way, and that you can set the basis to also talk about like more complex issues, like um, like uh, systemic oppression, etc. Like uh, maybe moving forward. And um, yeah, I think also, uh, Jenny, you also mentioned it earlier, like the historical traumas, like in terms of oppression, etc. they uh, are also really important in this context, right? Um, so um, for a question for both of you, like what, and I know we've talked about it already, but maybe just to be a bit more like concrete about it, like what does um, sex education, um, like how is it intertwined and involved with social justice, feminism, racial issues, um, gender equality, et cetera? Um, so maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that specifically. Well, social justice and feminism and sex education, um, they all intersect at this idea that um, all people deserve and should have access to the same rights and resources as everyone else, regardless of who they are. And so that's really what comprehensive sex education is about, right? That everyone should have access to understanding about themselves, their sexuality, um and others uh sexuality and everyone should have the same access so that and this goes back leah to your point about if only some people get it and other people don't um it creates inequities throughout life around um all sorts of access to resources and privileges and um and decisions that people get to make and um, it affects those who do get it. It it also hampers them when others are not also don't have equal access to it. So um, I think it's a it's really about access for every young person um, to get the education that they deserve and and need. Um, it's about um, agency, right? Uh, people know their rights and feel like they can use their voices to make change. Um, and sex education really does that. It really talks about good sex education, quality sex education, talks about um, having control over your body and your life and making decisions for yourself and having the power to walk in the world in a way that um, is good for you and also good for others at the same time. Um, and then, um, you know, advocacy. And I think that the piece around full inclusion and acceptance really moves forward to young people being able to advocate for one another, advocate for what they need, um, advocate for what they feel is right. And then when you look at adolescents, like that is that is a ripe time for this kind of work. And if we do a good job of um, helping to develop those skills and you know life skills like empathy and um, good communication skills and sense of agency and sense of feeling safe 
um, and in control, all of those together um, lend themselves to equity across um, gender, across sexual orientation, across race, across all, it, it, disability, um, it, it, social economic status, all kinds of ways that um, put people on a more level or equitable um, playing field. Yeah, I'm thinking of where to exactly add on. I'm in agreement. Um, uh, I There's also part of me, and I maybe I'm sound repetitive a little, but there's part of me that when we talk about social justice and, and racial justice and these ideas of fairness and equity, again, we've been hiding and not actually speaking with youth about race and the historical impact it has had on sex education as a field. Um, and I know I've mentioned forced sterilization already in the US, but like history of eugenics, there's there's so, so much trauma and exploitation of black and brown bodies that um, really plays into how we think about sex education. Some say as a tool for racial justice, but I really actually think it needs to exist and be framed from the beginning as, sorry, this lighting is just like really a lot. <laughs> um, it really, uh, <laughs> it needs to be considered that way from the beginning. So when you ask like, how is it connected? To me, it actually isn't connected. It has to be based in that from the very beginning. So when we start to talk about um, anatomy um, in very specific ways, how do we do it, right? What do the pictures look like? Why are we talking about them this way? Where did these labels come from? Um, I I think it's, it's all, it already should be sex education as racial justice, as same with reproductive and, and, and um, and others. Um, I also think when we think when when we talk about social justice, how are we thinking about community? Um, how are we really engaging with our community in intentional ways? Um, because again, like in history, movements and movements of queer and trans people of color have have been fighting for sex education, right? Have been fighting for gender justice for many many years. So if we think about if we think about this as a collaboration, which I think we've started to do this now, and many people are really doing this work and have done this work, um, how are we doing that together with parents, with teachers, with all educators, not just health educators? I love how, we, how we're thinking about like, let it be all teachers, let it be social workers who are in the school some days. I think it's, again, more of a collective effort. It has to be if we're going to think about social justice, feminism, uh, queer and trans rights, et cetera. And I, I would also add to that, um, and Jenny alluded to that, that our field as a whole has been really hobbled by um, our homogeneity. Our, you know, researchers tend to be white cisgender men largely, and teachers tend to be white cisgender straight women. Um, and that has really affected how we've done the research and how we've developed the goals and, and, and an overview. And I think we're, we're making really strong efforts to change that, to um, elevate marginalized voices within the community. And um, so I, we're definitely getting better, but I think that we need to pay much, we need to work a lot harder at, um, at, at, at diversifying and and bringing in voices of communities and uh, and folks who are in, who are being affected by sex education, which is everyone. Yeah, and I think that also relates. I mean, to legislation. Yeah, I'm. I obviously do a lot of policy work also. When you know, who are these legislators and senators? It's a very tough day for me in Oklahoma uh, with very specific bills now that are in place as of today, um, where I'm like. Cool. Like, let's talk to let's talk more about this. How actually this bill is about sex education, even though it's not labeled as sex education. That's seen as a separate thing. But if we're talking about gender identity and bathrooms, how are we not talking about menstruation, body body respect, all these other all these other topics that are sex education based are still built into other bills that are not specific to sex education in their naming. Um, so I think thinking about the don't say gay bill also, it's like, it's beyond the legislation where we also need to talk more about legislation in ways that incorporate teachers, that incorporate, you know, families and it, it's just, we have more, so much more work to do. <laughs> 
I think that's a great uh, segue into our last question. Um, so if you could give a short answer um, of how do you see the future of sex education and what would it look like? And also what are the kind of the changes that you're both hoping for for the future? Um, I think I've already spoken a lot, so I don't want to repeat myself. I, I will say that my hope, um, where I have most of my optimism, um, around sex education is, um, this sounds trite, but it's true, is in young people. Um, I see such a difference in how younger generations are growing up with a much better sense of sexuality and gender and um, the constraints of gender um, and um, they get it. They get it in a way that I think folks of my generation just don't. And I often sort of joke with my students that, you know, maybe we just need to wait for my generation to die off. Um, things will get a lot better. But I, I do, I, I really feel like there is a shift in how we think about these topics and um, and, and and that's coming. And, and I think the harder folks like the Don't Say Gay Bill and all that folks in these legislatures are pushing back, I think that's a sign of how much progress we are making in these fields and in these areas. And so um, they're feeling very threatened and as they should and are, are sort of pushing back. So I, I actually think things are getting better. And I think as we recognize the need to have, a, that we're not separate and apart, that we're everything and, um, and as Jenny said, that, that sex education is social justice and that we're not just in health education, but we're everywhere. Um, and that everything is a potential for sex education. I think as we start to see um, the, the universality of it and how important that is, um, I think it's gonna get better. I I already think it's getting better. Um, I think in some ways, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and some days lately, I feel like I'm back where I started from, but then I stop and I think, and I'm like, no, we are a lot further ahead than we were 30 years ago. Um, so um, I, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. I may not live long enough to see it get where I want it to be, but um, I, I have faith in those coming behind me and um, folks like Jenny and others who are doing this work in such incredible ways that, and, and people really, really thinking about this um, that are gonna be really great moving forward. Yeah, in short, in short um, I I think um, the future really of sex ed has to be with queer and trans people of color at the forefront um, and in community with 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 white allies or co-conspirators, whatever sort of language we'd like to use for ourselves in that way. Um, but I really think if we start to ask ourselves like who's in whose voices are we including? And why are we including them? And for what reasons? And what and and what that turns into how that turns into action in some way, I think is really important. And I think we're starting to do that. And unfortunately, the research world uh, and the community world, I don't think there's enough collaboration between between youth or students in that way beyond like you know research participants and and studies etc i think there are beautiful ways of doing humanizing research right but i do think the future of sex ed really needs to think about like i said this collective community that is built in uh, intentionally like the work is intentional um and i also feel like it's it's going that way but um just constantly being reflexive of our decisions and who's included, who has power in this space, I think is really important for classrooms, for teachers, and of course, beyond the school, because sex education is everywhere. We know this already, the four of us. Um, so that's where I would agree, and then just add a little. The four of us, and hopefully if now a few more people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Many of us. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, Jenny, Eva, uh, thank you so, so much. Um, we have reached the end of our time and thank you so, so much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you and um, to, yeah, 
share with us all your important insights um, and yeah, uh, about this extremely important and all encompassing topic. <laughs> um, thank you also Lia for co-hosting with me today. And uh, thank you. Thanks also to our listeners and our viewers for being interested in our talks. Um, yeah, would you like to say a last word for goodbye or? <laughs> Just thank you so much for organizing this and bringing us together to talk about it. It's it's exciting, and I'm so glad to be part of it. Yeah, same. Just thank you for this. This to me is just the beginning. You know, even though it it is an ending of uh, of our talk today, um, I really do hope that we continue to be in contact and and really do this together. Yeah. Thank you thank so you much. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, everyone, and right. see you. Bye. So to you. <laughs> Stay tuned for next week, where we'll have another book club episode. We'll be discussing the book We Should All Be Feminists by Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Thank you for listening to Pink Talks. Before we go, show some love for our favorite podcast by leaving us a comment and subscribe to the channel. We are Young Educators, a non-profit organization working on human rights, gender equality and active citizenship. And this podcast was created with the support of our team. Maria Cini, Amka Becherra, Ana Catarina Caldeira, Laura Staffier, 